Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and sports nutrition professor of almost 20 years, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. And this is Phil Stevens, strength coach on Strength Guild. And to be game this competitive powerlifter, got a meet coming up in about three weeks from today. Nice. This is Dr. Mike T. Nelson. I'm a faculty member at the Kerrig Institute. Uh, creator of the flexdiet.com and instructor Rocky Mountain University, a bunch of other stuff. And I am in Dallas, Texas today. Oh, wow. What's happening in Dallas? Yeah, I left the snow. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, visiting our friends Adam and Ashley and just hanging out here for oh. a few days. And then we're off to South Padre, Texas to Kiteport. I just assumed go. it was another conference or something that <laughs> you were at. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll be at uh, Paleo FX at the end of the month, though. So, And then the Fitness Summit, the first part of May. So come on out to both of those. Cool. Okay, everyone, we have a bunch of news and mail uh, coming up here. Maybe we'll do the news first. Uh, speaking of conferences, I just... We had one yesterday on campus. It was our annual fundraiser conference. It's, it was about... Um, the immune system. So let me offer one or two oh. things. Yeah, I, I, I'm usually the practical one, you know, because we have a biochemist, uh, and he usually talks about stuff that's very mechanistic, you know, MHC proteins and T helper 17 cells and all kinds of obscure cytokines. And so I thought, well, let's make this practical. As far as Iron Radio listeners, I think maybe the most interesting stuff was was that. I was talking about a couple of things that people are usually deficient in, you know, or inadequate at least. And we often talk about vitamin D, for example, on on the podcast. So I'm not, I won't go into that as much. We talk about fish oils as well, but uh, I did dig up recent information about how little people consume. So I thought that might be uh, worth mentioning to um, the Iron Radio listeners. But the average American only consumes combined. Um, EPA and DHA of about 120 milligrams. Um, that's very low. I mean, most most authorities would say effects start happening at about 500 milligrams. I mean, minimum. I mean, if you want to do something like lower your blood triglycerides all the way up to 4,000 milligrams of combined EPA and DHA. Um, there were a couple of worrisome naysayer type articles in the lit review like one of them was mentioning about how omega-3 fats could actually dampen your immune system i mean that's sort of how they reduce inflammation to the point that you could have increased infections i don't see that being a problem with healthy lifters you know um adult healthy lifters but and then there's always that niggling stuff about prostate cancer uh, very high amounts of omega-3 fats. Uh, the literature is very confusing when you look at it. Does it help or hurt prostate cancer risk? You know, and if we have a lot of high testosterone kinds of listeners, and it's the kind of thing you need to keep an eye on, I think, especially once you get, you know, to be our age, meaning the hosts here. Every once in a while, get your PSA check, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I try not to worry too much about that. It's such a collection, right? I don't think a lot of people realize, but... Uh, most men, something like 50 to 70 percent, if you look at different literature, of men end up with some degree of prostate cancer in their lifetime. Uh, yeah. And it, sometimes it's just so slow and smoldering, who cares? You know, if it's not metastatic and aggressive and whatever. Um, or stuff like, and I didn't talk about this as much, it was just stuff I saw in the, in the lit review, but I actually didn't realize that if, l- listeners, if you're young, like, like you're in your 20s, your prostate, right, which sits sort of at the base of your bladder, right, um, it's about the size of a walnut in your 20s. By the time you're 40, 
Uh, according to the Mayo Clinic, it's closer to the size of an apricot. And by the time you're 60, it's as large or even larger than a lemon. Wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, you know, so, and this is just something that just kind of happens. And I, anyway, so it's the kind of thing you want to keep an eye on. But, you know, there's lots of things up and down that could increase or decrease BPH or prostate cancer risk. I purposely don't want to get on finasteride or any of these DHT inhibiting drugs, okay. you know. Uh, I know some lifters are worried about stuff like aromatization or too much uh, 5-alpha reductase activity, you know, so you end up with that DHT that sort of feeds the prostate and may not do as much, if anything, for hypertrophy. But it, it might be part of the mix. I mean, you don't want to cut that down to nothing either, you know. So if you don't like the drug approach, there's salt palmetto. There's some things like that. There's things that reduce risk like um, pomegranate. You know, the, the lutein and lycopene in, in tomatoes and uh, green leafies like spinach. You know, so it's, it's just it's pros and cons. But I'm on a tangent now. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, very low omega-3 intake. And, you know, it's just interesting when it comes to things like anti-inflammatory uh, conditions or even cortisol release and stress. Your response to stress might be blunted. And, you know, in somebody who multitasking and living on coffee like I do. Uh, you know, so there's pros and cons, not to mention my family history of like arthritis. So um, what was the other one? Uh, like I said, I'm not going to bore everybody with vitamin D. Fish oils. Oh, and fiber. Uh, the effects of fiber on your gut and then the, the cascade and what it does to your immune system, I thought was pretty interesting, too. Like mm. um, you, you have less bacterial diversity if you eat very little fiber and the average americans getting somewhere between six and sixteen in fact the most recent data actually say about sixteen grams of fiber a day is typical intake but the institute of medicine the world health organization they say you need thirty to thirty five and when you under eat fiber you might say who cares so i'm i might be occasionally constipated no it goes way beyond that so you end up with um, uh, Sort of, I, I mean, I, I, I wrestle with how clinically relevant leaky gut really is, but I do know physicians very concerned about it. And you do end up with a less bacterial diversity <coughs> because you're not feeding the right bacteria with the fiber, right? F they like to get a hold of these metabolizable carbohydrates, uh, the fiber. You know, they sort of, the, the right bacteria will chew them down to short chain fatty acids. And it affects all kinds of things, including like the mucosal barrier of your gut and like i said different inflammatory cytokines um are, are kept in check in some ways by having enough fiber so it's interesting to see the immune connection with your gut and you know and that could really benefit uh your health and all kinds of things i mean if you don't want to walk around in sort of a low-grade inflamed state all the time a lot of people don't think that fiber would play a role like fish oils or vitamin d but it might so um that's sort of the highlights from that. Mike, I don't know if you've heard anything about fiber lately as far as, you know. Yeah, I think the, I agree with you that I, the more I think about it, like in the past, I'm like, I don't understand any of the uh, fiber guidelines, like where they came from. I mean, the data on that is eh, a lot of epi studies and some other stuff. But I think, as you mentioned, the connection with the gut and we're just trying to figure out what diversity is better. Um, to me, that makes a lot more sense in terms of why fiber is going to be more beneficial because the other stuff was always just kind of vague. It helps with gut health, and there were some epi studies to show it was beneficial, but I also wondered how much of that is just you're just not eating many vegetables, you're not eating many things that have fiber, so you're missing micronutrients and other you know compounds too. So yeah, it's all kind of really so much of what I've been reading lately from this little lit review on nutrition and immunity or, or prostate stuff lately, so much of it is basically exercise and eat your vegetables, you know? Yeah. And it's, that <laughs> sounds so generic. But, you know, my wife actually said, well, aren't simplest explanations usually the best? And that's true. Yeah. That's very Occam's <laughs> razor of her, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, that's something I think a lot of our listeners can feel good about that we do. You know, we try to limit obesity, at least sarcopenic obesity. I know some heavyweights will bulk up and become less than lean in the off season and whatnot. But yeah, the, the exercise and the at least the attempts at vegetables, you know, I think that's how, Phil, you pretty much address a lot of this stuff, right? You're just trying to eat a wide variety of, of, of and the impact yeah. is really huge. Right. So 
Yeah, we have something different every day, almost. So yeah, yep. Fermentable stuff like you've been doing, or um, mm-hmm. just any variety, because you're like, oh, look, there's lutein and lycopene in those things. It's neat to look at the mechanism, but the actual like clinical practice, the daily thing that you do every day, is in fact lift weights and eat your vegetables, yeah. <laughs> which is what we do. So, well, and just as a for sanity's sake, I mean, it's nice to have something different. <laughs> You know, yeah. So I mean, just that going that far. I mean, just hey, okay. We'll have Brussels sprouts today, or, or asparagus, or this, or that. You know, and it's just exactly. So yep, yeah. I was just telling Kelly this morning that it's actually I rather just do stuff like have spinach and tomato omelets in the morning than to go mm-hmm. buy a expensive pill. You know, yeah. that yeah. has lycopene yeah. or lutein in it or something like that. Um, it's delicious, like you said, and you mix it up right. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's broccoli or brussels sprouts or something this week and it's next week it, like we get these fr- frozen berry blends that i love to throw in my hot oatmeal in the morning it makes it like instantly ready to eat and some of those have pomegranate you know which again good for your prostate so just go for that variety of fruits and vegetables i don't think that's what most people do though you know they they get sucked into this habit of like the same 10 foods 15 foods and they don't think about the massive variety of the thousands of vegetables that you could probably consume yeah, and just a combination of them, too. It's like we barely understand some of the compounds or have identified them what they do, much less the combinations of all of them, too. It is, and that's true. I mean, I was having some dates this morning. I like to have dates with coconut, like a treat. But if when you think about phytonutrients or phytochemicals, um, that's not Easter candy. You know what I mean? There, yeah. There's always <laughs> other things in the fruits and vegetables. Yeah. And I can tell you, after decades of doing this, there's, you're right. There's always some new study about how this or that phytochemical or, or vitamin or mineral might actually reduce your risk. And so it, it, staying away from the really refined crap, it, it really makes a difference, right? The micronutrition are, is just ridiculously better. So, Yeah, that's why I get a little bit annoyed with some of the arguments on both sides that you know, oh, sugar is a devil and it's going to kill you. It's like, well, not if you can handle it as a fuel source. Mm-hmm. If you're you know, type 2 diabetic, then, yeah, you know, bolusing sugar, probably not a good idea. Yeah. But on the flip side, then, that sugar is completely harmless. Well, maybe, I agree, if you're a healthy person, you can probably handle pretty high doses. But what else are you missing out on if you're just eating that much sugar? Yeah. You know, I think sometimes we tend to assume that, this is in a, a healthy fitness population, and if you go outside of that, it's quite a bit different. Right on. And, and you know, I mean, if I eat, like this morning I had three or four of those dates, that's sugar, but it's not, it's yeah. not that refined added sugar. It's in such a package that's so much better. So I, I'm kind of leaning toward this idea where the feds are moving toward no, having no added sugar or listing added sugars. On, yeah. on labels and stuff because, you know, yeah, if you want to chug some OJ or eat some dates, that's that's far and away different, again, from having some, you know, caramel Easter candy, <laughs> something or yeah. other. So, okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, that was interesting. We, we, every year we just do these continuing education things for, like, doctors and nurses and whatnot. So uh, that was something that was, it was kind of interesting. Um, a couple of other things here. Let's see. Strength and Muscle Sport News. This is from the Journal of Social Psychology. This caught my eye. Sometimes I'll I'll look at Gen Pop Media and then I'll go dig into it, right? Um, I found this interesting. I don't like Facebook, right? Now, I know we have a Facebook listeners page, but I don't like that everything (laughs) is done through the central hub of Facebook. I mean, so many people, and we were early in queue to do this, use Facebook as their their forums. Like you could go buy a forums or even use free forums like the threaded discussions and whatnot. Or you could just use Facebook. I know it doesn't serve quite the same function, but it's pretty similar. Anyway, um, Facebook is already under fire for several things lately with privacy issues. But um, this is an interesting paper. Um, Eric Vanman and colleagues, it's called The Burden of Online Friends, The Effect of Giving Up Facebook on Stress and Well-Being. So again, Journal of Social Psychology, this is brand new. Check this out. Uh, It says, people occasionally do choose to walk away from social media, 
right? And even to take extended breaks from Facebook, this study investigated whether abstaining from Facebook reduced stress and cortisol concentrations. So think about this for a moment. A lot of times lifters are worried about too much cortisol. You know, of course, it plays a role of, it, you know, degrades muscle tissue. It can lay down abdominal fat. It can all kinds of issues, stress hormone. I mean, you need some for inflammatory control reasons, but so 138 active Facebook users were assigned to either a condition in which they gave up Facebook for five days or they continued to use it. And then they looked at their salivary cortisol. It says relative to those in the Facebook normal condition, the ongoing users, those in the no Facebook condition who walked away for a few days, uh, experienced lower levels of cortisol and higher levels of life satisfaction. Uh, is they they basically posit that large amounts of social information is taxing and it's enough to uh, cause stress and that even five days away can ameliorate that stress and reduce your cortisol. So you could almost interpret this like walk away from Facebook and get greater gains, you know, <laughs> so, uh, because of the cortisol connection there. So interesting stuff about how the way we live – you know, and what it's toll, I guess. So uh, I, I think a lot of it's about social comparisons. You know, why do people do things like um, Instagram? It, they, they post pictures that are sort of statements in some way about what what they're eating or how they're lifting. I mean, look at the fitness stuff on Instagram and you'll see what I mean. And all that comparison, I, I've been seeing quite a bit of this stuff lately in the news, may increase stress. And I think, well, Damn, what, what do bodybuilders experience then when you're standing there, you know, mostly yeah. naked in front of a thousand people on a stage being literally directly compared to someone else? So anyway, yeah, it might, might be good to walk away from Facebook now and again. Phil, you're so holistic in the way you do things. Do you ever get away from social media for a <laughs> week at a time or is it too much part of your work? Uh, yeah. It's part of my work, but honestly, I mean, don't tell anybody this, even though we're probably talking to 30,000 people right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't look at other people's stuff much. <laughs> so, yeah. I just hope they look yeah. at mine. So, yeah. Uh, I, I put my stuff out there. And uh, the thing is, I get like criticized from people all the time that I don't put anything of me out there. So, the Instagram and everything's like chucked full of selfies and this and that. But everything I put up is my people. You know, it's me filming my athletes and things like that. Right. So it's just more promoting the gyms and the gym and things like that. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I can't get away from it, except for, like, when we go on vacation and stuff like that. Uh, but, I mean, I'm on there every day putting stuff up, and social media is part of work. So Yeah. Yep. What about you, Mike? Now, you you do things like when you're in Mexico kiteboarding, I'm guessing you're not plugged in too much. Or are you? Um, I kind of have to be because I have clients that are online. Um, so I'm one of the things that I'm hoping to get to is with the certification and some other stuff with teaching is that over time I'll probably have less and less online clients. I don't know. I kind of ride the line where uh, I may just switch everyone, you know, once new clients come in just to, to one off calls or something like that. But I like the online stuff with the clients. I don't. I want the ability at some point just to completely unplug and you know, it's not fair to them if I drop off the grid for a week. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so doing better with that. So right now for social media stuff, I have a separate program I use that will let me kind of post stuff in the future. So if I have an article coming out, I can find it or a science study, I can find it and set it to go out at a specific time coming up. Oh, so I don't cool. have to be on there all the time. Mm -hmm. And then that'll actually uh, take everything from uh, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and I'll put it in one stream so I can go through and reply there. So it's actually me replying, but it takes all the streams and puts them into one. Mm -hmm. And it gives me a number in the corner so I can set a time. I'll say, okay, I got 20 minutes, and I can just go through all of those at once. Um, so, so that's been more helpful. And I kind of purposely do most content stuff through my newsletter. So that way I can kind of control that, and I don't, care as much about what happens with the Facebook algorithm and paid ads and all this stuff can be useful. I just, I like the newsletter cause I can control it. I can write it. I can send people to my site or wherever I want. Um, and I can do that ahead of time if I need to. So I've been 
when I was in Costa Rica, I took a couple of days where I just checked flying emails only. And then that was it for probably like three of the days there. Um, unfortunately, I had a paper and some other stuff too, so it wasn't able to get off as much. So it, yeah, I've been on there less and less. And even those two weeks, I wasn't on there much at all. I didn't even carry my phone with me. And the world didn't end, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> right. You know, not being a social psychologist, uh, it, it does make me wonder because I honestly don't know uh, what I'm hearing from both you guys is, well, I kind of put out some information, uh, and I kind of do the same thing, right? And, I, and it makes me wonder how many people actually do that. In some ways, though, we're information providers, if that makes yeah. any sense. So, like, even my Instagram, it'll be, it might be some food blogging. It might be a cool new thing that, you know, I took a picture in the lab, something like that, something that either – you know, past students or clients or colleagues might find interesting, but oh, I hate selfies. I'm with Phil on that. I never yeah, do that kind of stuff. That to <laughs> me, that's something yeah. that a a teenager does. You know, yeah. um, I'm probably just offended a lot of people, but <laughs> but um, yeah, and maybe it sounds a little arrogant too. Like, oh, we just put stuff out there for other people. Well, I just feel like we stumble across things that other people might, you know. Yeah not have the time to go do themselves or like phil says you, you know he puts others first and yeah. you know so. if i'm on there looking i'm looking usually to be entertained i don't get into i rarely post on other people's stuff because all it is, is arguments yeah. and i'll yeah. look for funny memes or something like that and share that but uh oh <laughs> right know, no that's true yeah uh, yep i don't see i don't really get caught up in the i can see how some people do you know they get like depressed over everything going on but yeah yeah I just look for the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Skim through it. <clears throat> on the plus side, it is cool. Like on Twitter and Facebook, what I mainly look for is like what are other researchers doing? You know, mm -hmm. like what it, you know, Stu Phillips put out or what are <clears throat> other people, <clears throat> excuse me, I know in the industry and what are they, you know, discussing? Because you'll find a lot of cool studies and stuff like that that I didn't, there's you know, so much that comes out. Yeah. Um, that's kind of a cool way I found of just filtering stuff down and to get their you know direct thoughts on it too right yeah if you follow the right people right yeah. so even information providers which in, on some level we are we rely on other information providers mm -hmm. right yeah and you get to people like oh, Stu definitely. Phillips just world-class guys and fun people nice sincere people yeah. Nick Bird, <laughs> oh, you know we got to get Stu on the show. I wonder if he's ever thought, how come Lonnie's not asked me to be on that show? I don't know. <laughs> because been Nick, before. Nick's been on, and you know some of his colleagues have been on, and I always just assumed that he that that Stu was too busy. But anyway, I can drop a note if you want. <clears throat> yeah, you know we should uh, this summer. Yeah. Like like I said, he's uh, arguably uh, I put him up there with like uh, you know Bob Wolf as far as like protein authority oh, and that kind of thing. And, you know. That's the kind of information you can trust and pass along. Yeah. Uh, okay. What else do we have here? Um, I got this from the Institute of Food Technologists. Um, and again, this was something that caught my eye. Uh, consuming more protein may not benefit older men. So again, this is something that I bet Stu already knows. <laughs> but according to a study published in JAMA, Internal Medicine, uh, eating more protein may not benefit older men. Uh, a study was conducted by Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, where older men who consumed more protein than the RDA, right, 0 0.8 grams per kg per day, did not see increases in lean body mass, muscle performance, physical function, or other well-being measures. Now, there, this got, gets even more interesting for our listeners because they start giving these guys testosterone injections and protein. It's like, oh, wow, this is like, you know, bodybuilding light for the old dudes, right? So uh, the clinical trial known as Optimizing Protein Intake in Older Men, the OPTI, OptiMen trial, it was randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind. Uh, the guys were 65 years old or even older than that. So they took older guys. They randomized them to either get the RDA for protein, right, 0.8 grams per kg, uh, with a placebo injection, um, 1.3 grams of protein per day with a placebo injection. So, in other words, just the higher protein. Uh, the RDA for protein with a weekly injection of testosterone or the higher protein with a weekly injection of testosterone. And I think a lot of our listeners would be like, oh, boy, I wish I was randomized into that group, right? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, all the participants were given prepackaged meals, right, so they could control the calorie and protein and whatnot. Um, the team, led by Brigham and Women's Hospital investigator Shalander 
Basin, Basin, B H A S I N, found that the protein intake greater than the RDA had no significant effect on lean body mass, fat mass, performance, physical function, fatigue, or other measures. Our data highlight the need to reevaluate protein recommendation for older adults, especially that those might have chronic diseases or some degree of frailty. So I'm like, wait a minute. You gave these guys testosterone and high protein and it did nothing for them? So now, again, we're not talking about people who are rigorously being trained, right? They're not, I didn't see any information on the resistance training. So as I want to do, I dug up the, the abstract at least. And here it is. Yep, 1.3 grams per kg is the highest dose. They did this for six months. So this provides a little bit more quantitation here. Six months they did it. They gave them 100 milligrams of testosterone enanthate weekly, uh, the ones who got the real uh, juice, <laughs> essentially. Uh, they <coughs> change changes from baseline in lean body mass, appendicular mass, and then trunk mass. So basically arm versus you know uh, core type stuff. Um, there was a gain of 0.31 kilos, you know, over that period of time. Um, no real changes between that. And it may, may have simply been that the dose was low enough um, of both the protein and the, and the testosterone. But no changes in muscle strength and power, stair climbing power, uh, health-related quality of life or fatigue. Interesting. No difference, again, between the protein levels, regardless of whether they receive testosterone or placebo. It did say, however, and this is not something that I think was reported quite as accurate, accurately as it could have been in the, in the journalist thing. This says fat mass did decrease in participants giving the higher protein, mm -hmm. uh, but did not change in those given the RDA. So the difference was um, over a kilogram of, of fat mass difference. So... It's interesting how they're trying to take this up. Again, I really would like to see what were what were the – I don't have details on the physical activity controls. But, I mean, obviously, if you're going to take a shot of testosterone and get protein, you'd like to put that to work with the right stimulus, right, of resistance yeah. training, I would think, would be key. So, Yeah. I mean, I think we've – well, I mean, I know I've seen it. I'm not going to speak for everybody. But I think we've uh, – I've seen people that – go on thinking it's a magic pill and it'd be a replacement or otherwise. And hey, nothing's happening. Hey, you're not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? You're just a water ball. It's, you know, it's not like Captain America. You know. Right. <laughs> you know, but uh and I don't think people I don't think the general population knows that. You know. Right. Even the athletes that are, you know, get popped in the Olympics and things like that, uh Arguably, they're probably working harder than they were before. <laughs> you know? Oh, right, yeah. Because it allows the recovery for it. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. And I think that's where people get mistaken. that They think it's some kind of, oh, he'll be Hulk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. when I see some of this stuff, the people who are their recreational you know, users. And, I mean, this yeah. was 100 milligrams a week. This is very reasonable, yeah. right, low-dose kind of thing. But you see these guys, yeah, they're they're gramming it. You know, they're taking massive yeah. doses, hundreds mm -hmm. of milligrams or even thousands of milligrams mm -hmm. uh, a week, and they're barely lifting it all, and they just look like water balls. They're just bloated little yeah. fools, you know, and you're like, that's, I in, don't know. In turn, I've seen the other, the opposite. I've seen the same amount that you're talking about, like 100 milligrams. Make drastic changes in seventy-year-old clients. Yeah, go a long way. Train, you know. Yeah, but uh, that's so. why I, I got to say I questioned a little bit of that. Like you would think if if they upped your protein to one point three grams per kg, again, plus the testosterone, I would I would think that there'd be some difference in their mood or strength. But again, it depends on the population and, like I said, the stimulus. If the resistance training stimulus isn't there, to me, hormones like testosterone, they sort of underwrite tissue mass, right? But they don't, by themselves, create the, the, the best stimulus, right? So the, the weights are the stimulus, and then the protein and the testosterone underwrite the growth. And, and again, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more detail. Maybe they, they provided that in the full paper, which I don't have access to right now. But, um, yeah, you'd like to see the right kind of training involved and that's why they would they need someone like you guys actually <laughs> to do some programming you know do the right programming for them otherwise they could be just wasting the the nutrients and the drug anyway 
Yeah, and there was another trial from the uh, uh, looks like the similar lab, uh, Basine, yeah. and they said the uh, effects on testosterone supplementation for three years on muscle performance and physical function in older men. So this is one of the longest um, double-blind placebo-controlled trials I could find. Just kind of looking here, uh, people when this uh, came in at a hundred to four hundred uh, testosterone range. Uh, they gave them 7.5 grams of a 1% testosterone or placebo gel for three years. And basically, they did find that compared to placebo, they did find changes in uh, stair climbing power, muscle mass power, um, and they were better at the end of that. So even at that, they probably lower dose. I don't know what exactly that supplement got them to in terms of the range, but um, I thought it was interesting that it was actually a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, too. So those are much more rare to find in that area, especially for three years. Right. That does differ from this one a bit. Maybe the length of the study, maybe six months wasn't enough because of the mildness of what they were doing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But again, so much of it is the stimulus, right? Why do our yeah. listeners lift? Why do we all lift? Because that's the initial stimulus that makes it all happen, you know. Yeah. yeah. So... I, I, I can't understand. Sometimes you'll talk about, like months ago, we talked about, oh, vitamin D doesn't decrease risk of falls. Well, you can't pop yeah. a pill and expect you to be, yes. more, be more agile. Oh, I didn't tip over today. Must be the vitamin yeah. D. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or take a shot. Yeah. And now now somehow, somehow you're more coordinated. What? You know, anyway. Yeah. It seems so obvious to us, maybe. But. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, the last thing I have with news before the mail maybe we'll just do the mail after the break uh, but i wanted to share i got let's see here from the institute of food technologist this is not a deep dive but once in a while i like to fire down the headlines so if you want to do a deep dive check out the institute of food technologists this is from their it's just the ift weekly so recent stuff that's happening around the world with food um U.S. Agriculture Secretary says the USDA won't regulate genome editing. U.S. Secretary mm -hmm. of Agriculture Sonny Perdue issued a statement providing clarification uh, on the USDA's oversight of plants produced through new breeding techniques, which include genome editing. So I think some people get more concerned than that, um, than maybe they should. There's a big difference between what scientists think about things like gene editing and GMO and what the average Joe is concerned about, but so it looks like the USDA won't regulate genome editing when it comes to plant foods. Interesting. And again, go dig everybody because I'm not going to give you details right with this little uh, blast. Uh, most food waste occurs at the consumer level. The Commission for Environmental Cooperation, an organization established by um, the governments of Canada, U.S., Mexico, whatnot, released a report on food loss. It looks like most of it is at the consumer level. And I think I could I could go with that. You do see a lot of people wasting food in restaurants, like not finishing their plate and whatnot. I don't think our listeners would do that as much, but a lot of it happens at home apparently. Um, here's one, pecans may improve uh, cardiac health, cardiometabolic health mark markers in people who are overweight. A study published in the journal Nutrients suggests that eating a handful of pecans every day may improve different markers of cardiometabolic risk, including insulin sensitivity. So interesting. Again, if you exercise a lot, that's going to have a huge impact on your insulin sensitivity. We talk about that sort of thing quite a bit. Um, you know, Mike, Mike's always on about the metabolic flexibility. So nutrients may play a role. Again, back to the, right, the phytochemicals <laughs> and what they might do for you. Uh, when your snacks are smarter instead of just refined stuff. Uh, U.S. food service deliveries grows thanks largely to breakfast and lunch, it says. Despite the overall weakness in the U.S. restaurant industry, food service delivery posted sizable gains in both visits and sales over the last five years, uh, reports the NPD Group, a global info company. So food service delivery, I think we all know that's where things are kind of going. Um People just don't have the time, unfortunately. I, I, I have mixed emotions about that. Uh, just one or two more. Pasta may not cause weight gain for those on a low glycemic diet. Carbs get a lot of bad press and blame for the obesity epidemic, but a review paper published in the British medical journal Open, BMJ Open, 
suggests that this negative attention may not be deserved for pasta. I think that may be what you put on your pasta and how you consume it and whatnot as well. But mm. um, so, yeah, I thought that was interesting. Uh, and then there's <clears> a bunch <throat> of stuff about what companies are buying other companies. You know, it's amazing to me how few companies actually control so much of the global food supply. You know, we, we've yeah. all seen that infographic. There's like five companies that own, uh, you know, two dozen other companies that own, you know, 50 other companies. And it just it propagates down, but it makes you wonder about the board of directors at those core five huge companies, you know, and what they're doing is really affecting what we eat, you know. And it, I see names in here like uh, Hershey, Monsanto. There's a lot of things, drug and food companies, and um, yeah, they're working behind the scenes in many ways. So, all right, that's. That's what I've got for the news. We I do have a, a bit of mail here as well, but do you guys have any news before we go to break? Uh, I've just got one super short one here. It's from Science Daily that uh, timing of stress hormone pulses controls weight gain. Um, so the title, I think, is kind of stretching it a little bit, but this is from a brand new study that came out in uh, Cell Metabolism. Uh, which is a transcriptional circuit filters oscillating circadian hormonal inputs to regulate fat cell differentiation. It was a mouthful. Um, but basically what they did is they looked at cells in a dish, and they were trying to determine if they apply these biochemical markers of stress, but they do it at different times, do they see different effects? Um, so one of the lead researchers here is Turell said, that the timing of stress does matter since conversion of precursor cells into fat cells occurs through a biostable or bi-stable switch, which means it can control the impulses with pulsing. So basically they're saying that the timing matters. Uh, our results suggest that even if you get significantly stressed or treat your rheumatoid arthritis with glucocorticoids, you won't gain weight as long as stress or the glucocorticoid treatment happens only during the day. But if you experience chronic, chronic continuous stress or take glucocorticoids at night, the resulting loss of normal circadian glucocorticoid oscillations may result in significant weight gain. Huh. Hmm. So that's the first time that I've seen anything that looked at the actual timing of that. And again, it's a sort of a, in a Petri dish type thing looking at cells expressions. But yeah, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, that... The ups and downs, the diurnal rhythm and the biological clock, chronobiology, yeah. that's getting a lot of attention these days, right? So natural fluctuation and flexibility, I know we agree on that stuff. So, yeah, and you know, just think in, in practical terms, I think of how many clients I have if they get really stressed at night tend to eat more. So maybe you can make an argument that may be worse in terms of timing. Obviously, a lot more work needs to be done, but um, yeah, I thought that was, that was super interesting. Mm. All right. Well, let's go to break. When we come back, we've got some uh, mails that I think are definitely going to call for your guys' expertise. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry and what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that, and uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single-digit uh, royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform 
our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, folks, we're back. It's Phil and Mike and Lonnie, and we are addressing listener mail uh, today. Uh, before we do, just quickly, I want to thank some of our um, supporters. Uh, that Again, we have a public radio-style format, and here they are, Austin, Rory, Matthew, Stephen, Zafer, and ASF. Uh, thank you for supporting Iron Radio. Help keep the light on. That's how it works. Uh, I will also uh, quickly a uh, note for Jeff, our contest winner on the Big Eats. Uh, please be patient. Give me a couple of weeks to get your mug to you. It does take a little bit of lag time to get that stuff out. Okay. So here are the mails. And I want listeners to know, I say this periodically, if you send us a mail with a question, uh, we may use it online. I used to double check back and forth every time, but just know that if you don't want us to use your name, just say, please make it anonymous, and we will. If you don't, we tend to use first names and not last names, just trying to be as respectful as we can, okay? So, having said that, this first one is from Anonymous Guy. <laughs> he says, uh, long-time listener, recent supporter, um, went to school with Dr. Mike a long time ago. Oh, nice. Uh, I'm 40 years old, six foot one, 210. Um, I have a 355 squat, 470 deadlift, and 265 floor press. And then parentheses, I don't bench. Um, I work out to be a better Western backcountry hunter. Uh, the nutrition content of the show is gold for developing my backpacking menu. Anyway, question. Based on this week's podcast on full body workouts... I usually don't buy into gimmicky fitness trends, but this one struck me. What are your thoughts on daily undulating periodization for the beginner or intermediate? Too much? Basically hitting each lift several times a week with different reps uh, and weights. And then he, he has a link on here, just a lay link. Uh, now, he does have more information here on his current program. And whatnot, but th that's a big question. Thoughts on daily undulating periodization for beginners and intermediates? Uh, I'm going to offer my two cents. I I like undulating periodization. I think changing rep schemes and the amount of weight you use it keeps your body on its toes. We have done episodes on that, um, anonymous guy, uh, and you can go back and dig around for that if you like. I like I like the higher rep days are a little easier on your joints. You know the heavier days kind of are, are sometimes less stressful metabolically because you can do you're more brief. You know and that kind of stuff you're not crossing certain thresholds. Uh, but Phil, what do you think about this uh, daily undulating periodization for the beginner or intermediate? Depends on what their goal is. <laughs> okay, well so, he I likes mean, to be strong. Purely, like uh, if it's if it's just. Uh, General fitness, yeah, I think it's great. I mean, mm -hmm. mixing it up and things like that. I mean, we do it some, but I mean, kind of alternate moves a lot. You know, we'll do some kind of squat, some kind of deadlift or hip hinge, you know, some kind of press, overhead press, some kind of bench, and that that will alternate a lot over the the course of a week of how many they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, if we're talking a competitive lifter, then I don't do it a lot. 
um, our, our, what you would call your variance and rep ranges would come more in your assistance work than it would in your main lifts. Um, cause if we're looking to be really good at squat in a one rep range, for instance, we're going to do a lot of low reps, you know, right. And we're going to have, we're going to have times where we're going to be doing high reps, but a lot of the time is going to be three and under. Um, and then our, our rep work will come, our variance will come in our assistance work where we're doing, okay, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 10, sometimes, you know, it'll be in that work and the unilateral work maybe and things like that. So, um, as far as a beginner, yeah, I don't think it can hurt. The only thing that I, the only thing that would be hard for me with a pure beginner is I don't know what they can do for 10, let alone what they can do for eight, let alone what they can do for five. So if I'm yeah. undulating that all the time, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. Like I have a new kid that just started and when a month ago he could barely squat the 15 pound bar. And so we've slowly worked him up. He was doing 40 for 40 pounds for sets of three. And on his last set, I was like, okay, let's see how many you can do in good form. And he knocked out 10 pretty easy. Uh, so, you know, you're talking what a 300% increase over a month. <laughs> right. <you know>? So <laughs> it's hard to periodize that out in any way, let alone an undulating pa- fashion. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I think it's worth saying for the listener here, it's not just a, a fad. Like this is stuff that you'll see in NSCA textbooks and things like that. Oh, yeah. it, uh, what Phil's talking about is more progression models. This doesn't lend itself to that quite as well. I mean, it does. Yes. You can undulate up and down throughout the week with different, like speed work versus heavy days and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But yes. um, yeah, if you're ramping up, I can see Phil's like crew. It would be yes. it would be um, chaotic to try to do this if if you're if you got to meet three months out. You know, and you're trying to very structured way move toward that, but yeah. Um, Mike, what about you? Um, yeah, I think overall it can be very useful. I mean, uh, like Dr. Mike Zordos has done a lot of great work on DUP. I know Ben Escrow, Lane Norton have used it very successfully. Um, so I think it again, it's it's like all things, right? It's very flexible. It depends upon what you're doing with it. I kind of agree a little bit with Phil that I don't, personally, if it was me having a beginner and I don't work with a lot of beginners at all, it's just way too complicated for what they need, in my opinion. They, they just get too wrapped up and, oh, this is changing, that's changing, I did my rep max here, and I'm just like, no, nah, just, just shut up and do five by five or something simple. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, straight sets, you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, get some good high-quality volume in. We'll worry about all that other stuff later. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're more intermediate advanced and you're, you're trying to you know, build like your squat bench and dead, I know a lot of people have had good success with it. Um, I have worked with a few people that got kind of broken and spit out by it because not because the DOP was bad or the way they were executing it was bad. I just think that sometimes it's a little bit too easy to get too aggressive with it mm-hmm. and... I like to have a little bit more movement and variety, even if someone's a power lifter. It's mm-hmm. the fine line of, yeah, you need to squat, bench, and dead, probably a lot. But once you start having pain and joint pain and other stuff from doing all those same repetitions, yeah, rep- you repetitive. need to start adding more variety and even like you know, frontal plane movement and mm-hmm. not a lot, you know, just a little bit to kind of keep them together. And I've seen some people run a DUP program and man, they can squat, bench, and dead and do almost no assistance work, mm-hmm. and, and their joints feel fine, and they do great. I've had other people I've worked with directly where that same model just beat the piss out of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they kept driving the same bus that way, and it did, you know, didn't work so well. So we you know, modified a couple days, and yeah, they still did some squat, bench, and dead, but you know, more variety, more off-axis lifts and stuff like that, and they did better. So mm-hmm. again, I think it depends on what's your goal, what you're trying to do and then pay very close attention to how you're responding to that. Um, so I like using uh, heart rate variability as a way to auto regulate stuff because I can look at the response of their system each day. I don't have to wait for like a rep max or something like that. And then I can throw whatever I want in there. So if I want to add a hypertrophy day or God forbid an aerobic day, since this person sounds like they're doing some, some long hunts and things like that, I can still check and see the response from it. So for me personally, it just allows me a little bit more flexibility by still having some type of auto regulation. Yeah, I can tell you the other problem that I have with it is, you know, if you're alternating from 12s one day to eights another day to threes another day, 
um, there's that whole muscle confusion thing out there or whatnot, but uh, there's something to be said for getting good at think, something. Like, we'll go through period stints where we might be doing 10s for four to six weeks. At the beginning of 10s, you suck at them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by, the, by the sixth week, you're pretty good at doing 10s. And then we switch it up, and we're able to list the response again because now I'm not used to fives. And that's a much mm-hmm. heavier weight. And at first, it you know it tears you up pretty good. And then, okay, now I'm used to them again. So I'll spend a little more time at a rep range to, and it's in my mind, it's not actually bad to get good at it. Um, yeah, yeah. At a rep range in and of itself, because usually when I get good at like threes, if I go and do a ten, all of a sudden I elicit this huge response change. You know, I get sore. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And. Uh, there's something to be said for that and also just getting good at something i mean a lot of a lot of that's neural just having the ability to a lot of lifting low reps is neural um you know i'm really really good right now three weeks out from a meet at doing like ones and twos i would probably be horrible trying to knock off a set of 20 Uh, so but i could get really good at 20s and we've seen this what plats against uh uh, oh yeah a little squat off thing Platts killed him in reps <laughs> but uh, because he was used to that. But Hatfield smoked him in, in singles. So uh, it just depends, on again, what you're, what you're looking to get good at. So yeah, if you're an endurance athlete, everything needs to be more towards that endurance side of things and not the maximal strength. Mm-hmm. So. I, I think the approach of seasonal, like just traditional periodization, Right. It can be good, too, because sort of what you're saying, it gives you several weeks to actually adapt into becoming good at something. So you you do a hypertrophy phase and then you put that extra muscle mass, that larger engine to work in a strength phase. And then maybe you move toward a power phase where everything's speed and explosion. Uh, That's valid. Right. But Mm -hmm. and the undulating thing is just it does that on a tighter scale. I like the undulating for some variety, you know, Mm -hmm. like if if you have been doing these. 12 week kind of periods, you know, meso cycles and whatnot. Sometimes this can, can mix it up a little bit too. Oh, yeah. And he's 40. So the, now it depends on how long he's been at this, right? But if his joints are sore and that kind of stuff, speed days with like 30 and 50% loads can be, mm. can be really nice actually, you know, maximal oh, dynamic yeah. kind of thing. Um, okay. So I guess there you go. Um, our anonymous listener, there's it sort of depends on your goals. Um, traditional linear type periodizations can be useful. Undulating can be useful. Sometimes it's just like what you're looking for in the coming year. You know, there's. I think they are all useful. I yeah. mean, uh, that's like I, I'm problematic when coaches get set into one thing. Like I just do yeah. this, and like I, I have a toolbox that is <laughs> never ending. And you know, there's times I got people doing conjugate tile style stuff, and just finding out what fits that lifter at that period of time, um, and they're all very useful. So yeah, I think it's it's sort of to Mike's point about repetitive strain injury and that sort of thing. If you get locked in, if all you ever do is straight sets, you know, five sets of five or three sets of ten, you never mm-hmm. do any variety or accessory work or alternate some of the the cadence or the volume. Yeah, I can see how that's gonna. Mm-hmm. You're going to plateau. You're going to get stagnant and, you know, and, and even I- irritated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always feel like I ride the fine line with um, if someone has a very specific strength goal, right? So you've got three lifts you need to get really good at. How good can I make them with specific practice on those lifts, but not really degrade them too much in terms of just basic human movement? Yeah. <laughs> You know, if their goal is just to get stronger overall, we may use those as indicators. Now I can get away, you know, if especially body comp is a goal, I can get away with a lot more variety. Mm-hmm. And I find if I have more variety, I can generally get more volume before yeah. I see any sort of detrimental effects, whether that's on HRV or joint pain or other things like that. Yeah. yeah. Listeners, for what it's worth, Mike has the largest repertoire <laughs> A variety I've ever seen. Like we'll be in a hotel and you're like, let's do some incline one arm, you know, skull crushers. And then let's do alternate split stance, this and that. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And I walk away sore like, what just happened? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anyway, it's good. It's like vegetables, right? Go for variety. We were just talking about that. Variety, man. (laughs) Okay. Um, This next one is is very straightforward. Um, Isaac writes and says... 
Last year, I noticed you said something about how black coffee is a good thing to drink before a moderate workout to burn fat. I do have a couple of questions. How long before should you drink it before working out? Does it matter if it's caffeinated? Does the temperature of the coffee matter? And last but not least, how many fluid ounces does it have to be? Okay, so this is the whirlwind response, just as general info here. Um, most scientific literature suggests 60 minutes prior to fasted exercise. It's going to be caffeinated coffee, right, because that's what's actually keeping up some of the intracellular processes. I'm not going to go on about phosphodiesterase today, but it helps keep the fat mobilization happening. Um, I'd suggest warm, not scalding coffee, but no milk and sugar. A little bit of sweetener, probably okay, you know, in the acute sense. It's not going to affect it much. Um, Performance research, we have always used 20 ounces of very strong coffee, so about 320 milligrams. Uh, that may even be more than you need for fat mobilization, right? The performance-enhancing ergogenic dose is 3 to 5 milligrams per kg of your body weight. Um, you might not have to do quite that much if you're more or less fasted, you know, and just going for, uh, you know, for the, for the fat mobilizing effects. Uh, most medium roast coffee is going to have about 100 milligrams of caffeine in an 8 to 12 ounce cup. Uh, I know cups differ in size. So generally, if you have a big cup of coffee or maybe two cups, of regular size cups of coffee, you're going to get that 200, 250 milligrams. That's probably enough. I would be careful, like if, you're, if you do fasting, cardio, walking uphill before breakfast, something like that, just being safe. It might be nice to have a little, you know, um, protein or Gatorade or something in your hand. Once exercise begins, you will not interfere with the fat mobilization. Uh, so that's something uh, worth noting too. So uh, I don't know, Mike, do you have any thoughts on, you know, worthwhile, uh, you know, worthwhileness of coffee you know, for fat loss or? Uh, I don't, I don't personally think for fat loss, it's that useful. Like you said, I, I, I'm not convinced that lipolysis is a rate limiting step for most people in that. It's usually fatty acid oxidation. Mm -hmm. So how much fat you're actually burning. It appears that most people tend to, you know, free up uh, a fair amount of fat. That's probably not that limiting. Um, I do think like you studied Lonnie, that the effect on the nervous system is very real and can make a, a difference in terms of performance. Um, and then you guys use VIA because it's very standardized for caffeine content. True. There's an old study from, I want to say it's McCluster, but I could be wrong on that, that looked at the how variable caffeine content was from a Starbucks AM breakfast blend they got every day in a row for six days, same place, same coffee, same type, and it varied by more than 200 milligrams in caffeine. So pretty wide variability if you're just kind of brewing your own coffee. Good point. You know, probably fine to do if you're at home, but if you're trying to use it for a competition or you're trying to be you know, very specific with it, it makes it harder to try to determine exactly what's going on. Yeah, there were tweets going around just a few months ago uh, about a study that Starbucks coffee could literally vary by day a week, day of the week, right? Oh, totally. Yeah, like between yeah. it's it's like five hundred milligrams on Monday, you get out by Thursday and it's down to like two fifty, and you're like, how does yeah, was, how yeah. does that happen? Last one. This is from Tyler. Been listening to Iron Radio for a year, and I realized uh, you're a nearby professor. Uh, I'm a middle school teacher nearby. I'll withhold it. And my brother even had you in class, just wondering if it'd be possible to talk to you <laughs> about nutrition and training. Uh, currently, I compete in powerlifting myself. I run a strength program for our football team. The podcast is one of the best I listen to, and I love the research you guys talk about. Just trying to learn new things, and nutrition is something uh, I have little knowledge of. Uh, any advice would be awesome. Thank you for taking your time to read this and putting out a great podcast. So thanks, Tyler. I appreciate that. Um, I typically don't work with people individually. I don't even know if that's what you're asking. Uh, I, we're usually happy to talk shop, but you've already clued into the podcast, and that's probably the best source you're going to get, right? Because you're going to get something from three perspectives on almost any topic. Uh, so um, cool stuff. Uh, I appreciate that the reaching out like that. Um, and it's a good point, right? Staying up on the nutrition stuff you know, along with everything else is, is uh, interesting at the very least and extremely helpful at best. So Good good luck getting middle school kids to follow your nutritional advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Right. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. But. I was just reading something about Gen Z people that were have been born. They were born after 1997, and some of what how they think in their food purchases and stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, like, to your point, you know, <laughs> good luck, <laughs> good luck with those guys. Anyway, <laughs> all right, um, that's about all we've got, everyone. We have some good guests coming down the pike. Uh, normally, I don't mention guests, but I mean, we have Dr. Ruscio coming back on the gastroenterology specialist. Um, and we just, I've just been going back and forth the past few days with Captain Kirk and Marty Gallagher. That, if you want to talk about like powerlifting, you know, elite or, or yeah. powerlifting then and now, those guys are, I consider, going to be on our, um, you know, like trophy list as far as, you know, <laughs> high profile guests. So yeah, uh, that'll be a fun one. video of Kirk doing a thousand pounds for a double. Oh. Still one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And it was in the, you know, it was in the Ed Cohn type squat gear. So I mean, it was yeah, basically a thick singlet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, and those yeah. guys are characters too. So yeah. uh, it'll be that that should be fun. So we do have some guests coming down the pike, but we need to wade through this mail and news because I guess Iron Radio has just gotten big enough; it backs up on us, right? So we gotta gotta wade through it. I don't want to ignore you know the people that need interacted with. So, all right, fellas, all right, have a good one. Awesome. See you guys. Hey, listeners. Have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store. One for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry. And they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store, uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun, heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org. And um, let us know what you think on the forums. And certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.